All right, so I'm going to pass this around. Try not to lose any of the sheets attached to it. I uh, forgot to get a roll sheet, so I'll just have you please print so that I can see your name clearly. Can we sign in for earlier dates? No, it doesn't work that way. So today we're talking about integrated marketing communication. And it's one of the most important parts of marketing, obviously. We organize marketing around product, price, place, and promotion. And so today we're talking about the promotion aspect of the marketing mix. And I put the uh, communication diagram up on the dry erase board over here that you can find on page 432 of your textbook. And the reason I put this up here is I want to give you an example. I want to show you a commercial and see what part of this you think is, what part of this uh, model is the commercial illustrating. Because communication is so critically important. And if we go back to the beginning of class when we talked about philosophy, one of the things that we talked about is how can you really know what you know? Or is it all just socially constructed? How do we know that this is a table and not a desk? Or maybe it is a desk. Is it the purpose to which we use? And so communication is really, really uh, can be a difficult thing. But it's absolutely critical for marketing that we are clear and that we speak with one voice. Now, we used to offer full courses, for example, in advertising. We don't anymore. We now offer a course called Integrated Marketing Communication because it's become more than just advertising. And you have to be able to be effective in communicating with your customers, clients, constituents across a wide variety of media, not just in uh, what we might consider the traditional advertising. So, for those of you who have your book on page 432, look at that model. You can't see my diagram over here. So what we've got is we've got a source. That's the person who wants to send the message. They're going to encode it. You have to have a similar or somewhat overlapping field of experience. So this little triangle says encoding. You choose your channel of message. There's noise potential here. The receiver gets it, decodes it, and then has a response, and there's feedback. And we should be able to tell whether or not we're talking about the same thing, although it may be more difficult than we think, and particularly with certain types of channels. So let's watch this first ad. I am totally blind. I began losing my sight to an eye disease when I was 10. But I learned to live with my blindness a long time ago. So I don't let my blindness get in the way of doing the things I love. But sometimes it feels like my body doesn't know the difference between day and night. I struggle to sleep at night and stay awake during the day. I found out this is called non-24, a circadian rhythm disorder that affects up to 70% of people who are totally blind. Learn about the link between non-24 and blindness. Call 844-824-2424. That's 844-824-2424. Or visit your24info.com today. Don't let non-24 get in the way of your pursuit of happiness. Now, what part of that is problematic in terms of this model? I tried to find the one where it doesn't even say, it says contact your doctor uh, for more information. They never say it on the video. There's another one that shows a woman walking out in the street with an umbrella. And it says, it just on the screen, it says uh, contact your doctor or you know, look at us up at vanda.com or contact your doctor and it prints it on the screen and never says it. What's wrong with that? This entire commercial <laughs> is for people who are, I mean, why would you even, why do you even have the visuals? There. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're selling this wonderful product, you're showing this person who's living a fulfilled and happy life, his vision, 
and you're showing it to people who what? Can't see. Can't see. Or you're not show rather you're not showing it. So what part is problematic with this commercial in this model? What? It's field of experience, isn't it? If you've been blind since birth, which she says, you, you have no you have no field of experience with that. That's problematic in terms of communicating. It's a it's a lovely commercial, isn't it? Very sweet. But I, your target audience, it seems to me, is missing out on a whole lot of things. And so maybe it's not the most effective channel of communication for advertising this product. I want to give you another example and see if you can figure out what's wrong with this. This comes from a book called Snowball, which is the biography of Warren Buffett. You all know who Warren Buffett is, right? As business students, this should come tripping off your tongue who Warren Buffett is. The Oracle of Omaha. The second richest man in the world. And at one time, he was the richest man in the world. He is the chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. And before I read you this passage, there's probably nothing more annoying than being read to, but I think this passage is worth reading. I'm going to give you some background on uh, the scenario that I'm about to give you. At one point in time, a company called Solomon Brothers went into financial distress. They were an investment firm. And the United States government convinces Warren Buffett and his alter ego, a person that you've probably never heard of, whose name is Charlie Munger. And Charlie Munger is the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway to sort of step in and take over Berkshire, uh, to take over Solomon Brothers and deal with the problem. And during this process, they come to think that maybe the CEO of Solomon uh, wasn't necessarily fully engaged, but that maybe he should get somewhat of a severance. We generally call these golden parachutes that executives get when they're given a, a big package to leave if they're fired by a company. And so, uh, Solomon's um, chief executive officer's name is John Gutfrey, and he has an attorney who's riding around with Charlie Munger in the back of a limousine trying to negotiate the settlement offer for his client, John Gutfrey. Everybody thought that Gutfrey would get something out of this, but there was a big disparity between what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger thought was fair and what, what Gutfrey and his lawyer thought were fair. So in terms of the communication process, look at this model again. If you've got it in your book, and I'll read this to you. So Munger is now on the stand in front of an arbitrator as a witness for John Gutfried. <coughs> Gutfried's lawyers called Charlie Munger as a witness. Frank Barron of Craveth, Swain, and Moore had attempted to prepare Munger, who was utterly impatient with the process. Although Barron had prepared Munger by himself, Munger, a lawyer who disliked paying legal bills extemporized to the arbitrators that in preparing him for his testimony, Craveth had employed an excessive number of expensive paralegals and aspirin carriers. When he began to testify, every word that came out of his mouth had nothing to do with what we'd gone over, said Barron. Putting Charlie Munger on the witness stand was the most nerve-wracking, hair-raising experience I have ever experienced as a lawyer. Munger's confidence as a witness was unmatched. A number of times, the lead arbitrator, growing irritated, admonished him, Mr. Munger, would you please listen to the question before you answer them? Munger insisted on the night that he had met with Philip Howard, John Gutfried's lawyer, he was deliberately not listening. Being polite, but I wasn't paying much of attention. I sort of turned my mind off. I was just sitting there politely with my head turned off. Howard, Gutfried's lawyer, asked whether he'd made a conscious decision not to talk as well as not to listen. No, said Munger. When the time came to talk, I talked. One of my faults. I'm fairly outspoken. I may well have discussed some individual things that got through my band of indifference. This is one of my most irritating conversational habits. It has followed me through the course of my life. So every time something would get through and I could see a counter-argument, I would give it. I believe you would ask for indemnification for your client against lawsuits. This being a legal matter had gotten through my band of indifference. I said to you, you don't even know what you're going to need. God knows there will be a litigation. This will be a big damn mess. 
who knows how things are going to work out. And you're misrepresenting your own client if you think it makes any sense to get into any of these issues at this time. Was this a conversation in which you were tuning out? Guthrie's lawyer asked. No, I tend to tune in when I'm speaking myself, said Munger, under oath. I tend to remember what I say. Was this a conversation in which you were deliberately not listening at various times? What? What did you say, said Munger? I just tuned out again. I wasn't doing it on purpose. Was this a conversation in which at various times you were deliberately not listening? I'm ashamed to say it. I've done it again. Will you please do it one more time for me? I'll attempt to use some effort this time. Howard repeated the question for the third time. You bet, said Munger. I was going through the motions, just sitting there with my head turned off. In what mental state the arbitrators, the lawyers, and Gutfried heard these words can only be imagined. Regrettably, much of the misunderstanding seems to have lain in Philip Howard's unfamiliarity with the outward signs of Charlie Munger's mind. He had labored all that evening under the illusion that he and Munger were having a conversation. He didn't recognize Munger's occasional replies and intermittent thought bursts ignited by some random mic that had pierced Munger's band of indifference. Whenever Munger objected, Howard assumed they were negotiating, not that he was simply being lectured to. When Munger said nothing, or admitted a grunt, or moved the conversation along, Howard inferred that Munger agreed, or at least that he had no objection to whatever had been said. Nobody had explained to him that Munger's head was turned off the entire time. What's that in terms of this model here? What's the problem with that communication? It's what? As a result of what? Which part of the model? It's noise. Noise is all of the stuff that interferes with us receiving the message. It's you playing on your iPhone rather than listening to me or doing whatever else it is that you're thinking about, or the background, or somebody else, your phone ringing, your vibrating, all of those things that interfere with the message. And so it's critically important to understand and to really think about these things when we talk about communicating with our clients, customers, and constituents. Now a big part of that is not just what we say, but what? It's also body language and tone and inflection and things like that. The Russian linguist Mikhail Bakhtin says that we write stories in monoglossia. However, conversation is naturally heteroglossia. We want our stories, and you need to think about this because advertisements have become miniature stories. We want our stories to be in a linear fashion, but that's generally not how we actually talk or engage. So a big part of this is body language, so I want you to think about this and how you can change not only what you're saying to others through your body language, but what you say to yourself. So this is a, this is a TED Talk by Amy Cuddy, who's a business professor at Harvard University.
you ask about the final board? Uh, this is the board. Yeah. So everything comes down to the wire. I had to move right, the pricing in. into this one because we didn't have enough time to cover it last time. So it will cover. 13, 14, um, 16, 17, 18, and 20. 18 and 20. It does not cover chapter 15, which was logistics. I don't think it covers that one. This little ball right here. Yeah. Thank you. 